say what I had to read in two weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how do I start? I had this list of questions somewhere, which is fine. Now I'm going to talk about your work and what I've learned from it and the process of your writing as well. Should I introduce them or they have, they've already done that? Uh, she won the booker. Um, she's won a number of other awards as well. Um, her book is called Patsy, and Bernadine's book is called Woman, uh, Girl, Woman, Other. Um, let's start with the easy questions. <laughs> um, what influenced um, the writing of this particular book? Oh, damn. So you put us on the spot immediately. Goodness. So, hi, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, I should say. Um, for those of you who went to the first panel, glad to see you again. Uh, so Patsy, um, you know, I started writing Patsy the same year, or actually a year after I started writing Here Comes the Sun. So really they were like twin, twin projects going on. It's just that Here Comes the Sun took off, you know, so I put Patsy on the um, shelf and said, okay, Patsy, you wait. What inspired me to write Patsy? So, I was born and raised in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica. I migrated to the US, um, you know, for many reasons. I mean, um, three of which I could, uh, off the top of my head, for better up, upper mobility, more opportunities. Um, and also, I wanted to really, I was also coming out to myself um, as a lesbian in, um, in Kingston, and I didn't know how to deal with that. And so, you know, between the classism and of course um, homophobia, I was like, you know what, I need to leave. Um, and so come, when I went to the United States, it was more like out of, um, because I desired personal freedom. So I exist in the United States now as an immigrant. Um, and of course I, came, I went to a college, but before me, my father existed as an undocumented immigrant. And the practices of our society, and these were the, the immigrants who are not as educated. So, um, they weren't coming to the US for college. They weren't coming to work in the tech industry. Um, these are immigrants who come and they end up cleaning toilets or doing the jobs that, that, that Americans don't want to do, right? And so I used to commute in the mornings um, to teach at the College of Staten, Staten Island as a, I was an adjunct professor at the time. And I remember going to work in the mornings with these women and men, you know, some of them were probably nannies, these were Caribbean women and African women, nannies in the mornings or the guys had on their construction gear. And I said to myself, you know, I don't know, so I, I, I always look at people as inspiration, which is why I'm always existing in public spaces because I like to eavesdrop. I'm really inspired by interacting with people. And so what came to me was um, a woman who was sitting there next to me on the subway riding into Manhattan who also, like, like I had to, um, who questioned, you know, what, what I questioned why, why did she come, what did she leave behind, right? Um, but going even further than that, when Patsy started confessing to me in a letter format of her life, you know, writing back to her mother about her life in America. Um, what it felt like at the time was just, oh, you know, um, I've seen it done before, right? I've seen these letters from immigrants um, in the U US, Canada, or the UK writing back to relatives. But what I never saw explored was the immigrants who come that are not doing it for altruistic reasons. The ones who, don't, who are there, but they're not sending money back home to raise a family. They're just there by themselves, right? So Patsy's a black, working class Jamaican woman. Um, and I wanted to explore this concept through um, her lens. What is it um, like to be a black working class Jamaican woman who, first of all, you have no ownership of your body, you have no autonomy to make such a drastic move as to flee her island, Jamaica, to the United States and abandon her five-year-old daughter, True. Right, who the story also follows true, who comes of age in Jamaica and questions her own identity, but more than anything else, um, questions her mother's abandonment. Um, and so, so I wanted to explore that um, particular part, um, particular storyline, um, especially again women, through the um, lens of this woman. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, what I intend to do is to um, have them talk about their work and their influence, etc., and read excerpts of the work as well. Um, one thing that I always notice when I'm put on panels like this is um, that I start by thinking these are just two different books, um, focusing on two different ideas. And when I get through them, I realize that they have a lot in common in the end. And that's what I found from 
finishing hers and reading yours and realizing that the story of uh, immigration also happens a lot, a lot with a number of characters in your work. Um, but it's a work that is very deep and layered and textured with so many different people um, whose lives eventually end up connecting to each other. Um, so first of all, congrats on winning the Booker. And um, I want to know what actually influenced uh, the story. How did it start and how did you get there? Yeah, so um, this is my eighth book and I decided I wanted to write a book about as many black British women as possible because we're not really present in black British literature. It's as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> if you think about the sort of presence of black people in Britain in the 20th century and 21st century, uh, we started to come in big numbers after the Second World War and really the sort of second generation, my generation, are the generation who started to publish in any um, great number. But a lot of writers come forwards and then they disappear. So they publish one or two books and then they disappear. So then we reach the stage which we're in now, which is the 21st century, whereby there are hardly any black British women publishing novels. Um, in fact, this year, I would, I don't know, maybe four of us, publishing adult novels, um, and there are thousands of novels published in the UK every year. So when I started this book in 2013, I thought, I'm going to write a novel which has as many different kinds of black British women in it as possible. And um, I began with one character who's called Carol, who comes from actually a Nigerian immigrant family. Um, she goes to a, she's, she's working class, her father dies, her mother's a cleaner, she goes to a state school, but then she gets to go to Oxford and becomes a banker. And from this, um, lots of other characters grew, such as her mother, Bumi, who um, also has her own section in the story, and then her childhood friend, Latisha, who has her own section in the story, and also her school teacher, Shirley, who has her own section in the story. The novel eventually ended up with 12 primarily black British women, and they represent different ages. The youngest is 19, the oldest is 93, um, different sexualities. So about half the women are straight, but about half of them are on the queer spectrum. Um, different classes, so quite a few women begin working class and end up in another class. Um, different occupations from different parts of the black world. Um, different relationships to different parts of the UK. Um, and different generations. So there are women of every generation in between the 19-year-old and the 93-year-old. Um, and so I just wanted to explore the heterogeneity of who we are in this society. Um, and then through doing that, I was then able to create all these stories. So each character has her own storyline. Each character has her own section in the book, even though it's a novel, it's not a book of short stories. Um, and they all go on some kind of um, journey from childhood through to the present day. And we see them with their relationships. There are four mother-daughter relationships. Uh, we see them with their... Um, their struggles or experiences of the work environment, of the education environment. We see them with their friendship circles. We just see them in every way that we exist in this society. Um, and so that, that, but the beginning of it was very, very simple idea. How can I create a novel with as many women as possible who are all equal protagonists in the novel? Um, I'm surprised you said the story started with Carol. I was thinking of Ama, for instance, who seemed to dominate the story in, in, in many ways. Um, how challenging was it to, to be able to create 12 different characters and have the stories weave into each other that way um, and still be a novel rather than a short story, even though the stories seem to stand alone and then eventually weave into each other? So writing 12 characters, I think, I mean, it's always a challenge writing anyway, but it is my eighth book. So I have written many, many characters in previous books. So it's something that I'm used to doing. Um, some of them were more challenging than others. So for example, the 93-year-old is a farmer who lives in the far north of England um, in a place called Northumberland. And, you know, she's, she's been on, in the far, on the farm all her life, her family farm. She's 93 years old. It's been in her 
family for 200 years, I had to write her life story, which is as different from mine as anyone else's. And she's a woman of African heritage. Um, so she was a challenge. I also have a non-binary character who was more of a challenge because I needed to understand at a deeper level what it is to become non-binary or to feel yourself to be non-binary. Um, and then some of the other characters are a bit closer to home, like Amma is the theatre director who opens the show, and she's kind of based on my younger self in the 1980s when I was running a theatre company and I was very radical and very vocal and quite angry. Um, and then her daughter, Yaz, she's closer to home in that she's based on a couple of the younger women I have in my life and, and I've had for a long time, sort of god godchildren. Um, and then the other characters, they, they come from really just absorbing everyone I've ever known everything I've ever seen. I mean, that's where characters come from. And, you know, no single character is based on particularly a particular individual, but they are all conglomerates of the kinds of people I've come across in my life. Was there a second part to that question? Um, I, I actually made a noise just now, I'm sorry. So, um, because I also have a non-binary character in, in um, Patsy as well, that's true, her daughter, who comes of age, um, questioning her identity, mostly because she doesn't fit in as boy or girl. You know, true um, would say she's a soccer player, right? Um, and so it was challenging to write that non-binary character as well. In fact, that was where most of my research um, happened, where I was asking classmates back in Jamaica. So for those of you who, um, I mean, I guess it's like Nigeria, I guess, but going to going to high school back home in Jamaica, you know, we had to wear uniforms. We had a lot of all-girls schools and all-boys schools, right? And so I, you know, I always questioned, you know, the individual who never fit in um, to society's um, standards of, of masculinity or femininity, I always wondered how they got through that, right? How they got through those years. And so it was going back home and, well, not going back home, reaching out on the internet, thank goodness for Facebook in that sense, um, to uh, individuals who went to school with me and I would ask questions like, what was it like for you um, going to St. Andrew High School or going to Immaculate um, or going to, um, you know, um, Malta Vernia, right? Existing as you um, were expected, but feeling how you are. And it was really heartbreaking to hear those um, stories, but I kind of put that in True, where True also feels that way. She's going to an all-girls school um, in this book, and this, this, this is her mother's expectation. So one thing that Patsy told True before she left was, be a good, obedient girl, and I'll be back for you, right? So not only is that a lie, but it's a trap. So already Patsy's boxing her um, true into this box, right? This expectation of th that good, obedient girl. And um, for her now to have this resentment towards her mother, but more than anything else, this guilt, right? Where she, that she feels like, oh my gosh, am I, I have to be this for, mo for my mother to return back to Jamaica. Um, and, and I wanted to, it was more playing around with gender, you know? Because again, with, even with the migration theme, men leave all the time, right? Fathers leave or sometimes fathers abandon um, children, but it, it's not a conversation, right? And so um, I wanted to really say, okay, Patsy steps out, outside of that um, gendered box, but so does True in that way um, as well. Um, yeah, it leads me to the question I've, I've always wanted to ask um, about the challenges that Patsy faces and the one True faces. Um, do you think, are there, are there similarities in your estimation uh, as to how you intended to create, to, to portray the, the struggles they went through? Because um, Patsy seems, or seemed from the beginning to know who she was. And True seemed, I mean, at least in the way it was written, we went through True's journey of discovering herself and figuring herself out. Uh, but Patsy always seemed to know who she was. Is there, in your um, own estimation, did actually, you plan to have any demarcate difference between their challenges? Um, you know, I mean, I feel like yes and no. I mean, Patsy knew she's a, she was attracted to Sicily, but she didn't know, right? Patsy really is this woman wanting to find her place in the world. So one, Patsy was never given a choice in the first place. You know, here she is existing as a working class Jamaican woman. You know, she's not um, going to the, these quote unquote elite high schools that's gonna funnel her into college and in grad school or anything like that. Patsy, from her own understanding is that she was robbed of her innocence 
parents really, really early in life, right? And so to, for somebody like that to grow up with this, um, this lack of um, word, wordiness, right? She grew up seeing her mother, you know, worshiping Jesus figurines and the Virgin Mary figurines as opposed to having food in the cupboard, right? So somebody like that growing up and seeing her mother turn to the church, you know, um, she questions who she is. Like if she's not, you know, God himself, then she's nothing, she's nobody. And when she comes of age now, she feels she has nothing to offer her daughter true. She has nothing to offer, and it, she feels like she, in, in a world where, that she cannot change, then you know there's, that, there's guilt associated with bringing up a child in that. So what Patsy did, she leaves true with, with True's father, Roy, and goes to America with no inclination of coming, with no um, thought of coming back home. But it was really for her to secretly escape motherhood, but kind of, kind of save her daughter from from um, what she went through, fearing that she might become her mother as well. Um, so I tapped a lot into generational trauma and also mental health as well, which I know we're gonna talk about on the panel, but. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, the style of the book, which I'm sure you heard a lot, um, a number of questions about. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what, what informed that particular choice of, of uh, poetry-like type of narrative? Yeah, so now I remember the second part of your question. Um, so I call it a fusion fiction. So the novel is an experimental novel, but I do like to always say it's readable, because when you say experimental to people, they think it's something inaccessible and difficult. So the, the novel is very readable. It's an experimental novel in the sense that each, 12 woman, each of the 12 women have their own sections um, and their stories fuse into each other's so it's like as I said there are four mothers and daughters but they also fuse into each other's in all kinds of ways and often you don't realize how they are interconnected there are sort of X, num X degrees of separation between the women you don't realize what those degrees of separation are until you've got to the end of the book and then you think oh this is so and so and this is so and so who I read about earlier so <clears throat> so that's that's unusual for novel, the fact that their stories kind of fuse into each other's in that way. Um, it's also unusual in that it's not plot driven, but there are lots of mini plots if you want to look for them, um, but there isn't like a single overarching plot. But also in terms of how I've written the text on the page, um, it, I don't use many full stops. So, um, or, or, or capital letters. So that also makes it experimental. But um, I call it a pro-poetic patterning on the page, um, <clears throat> which is kind of intellectualizing it, perhaps more than it needs to be. Um, but sometimes you've got to do this. Um, so when you read it, it's a very free-flowing reading experience. So um, on the page, with the absence of full stops, it just reads in a, a very kind of flowing way, which allows the story to be told going backwards and forwards in time, but also inside the characters and outside the characters. And it's almost like a stream of consciousness in that when you read it, you're floating along the consciousness of each character when you get to them, until by the end, all these women and their subconscious is kind of like floating around inside you. Um, and so that's the form I used, and it's a form that I use for my novel, Mr. Loverman, but I only used it for small sections of Mr. Loverman, and I really enjoyed writing it. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, the, the, the initial draft of it, because each novel I write goes through many drafts, the initial draft of it was very easy because it was actually a free-flowing writing experience. But then editing it was very difficult because when you start to mess around with punctuation and grammar, it makes it quite hard to be able to tighten it and rein it in. And it probably took a couple of years to really edit it so that it was as polished as it could be. So, but, uh, but you decided from the very beginning that you were going to write just like that? Yeah, it was, that's how it started and that's how it ended. Some people are calling it a verse novel, and I have written verse novels, but I don't call it a verse novel. I call it a fusion fiction, because I wasn't really writing poetry, yeah. but it uses some poetry techniques. Yeah. And um, there's another question I, want, I was going to ask about um, True and her relationship with her father. Um, Jamaica, I assume, like Nigeria, um, has a lot of homophobia. 
and usually it's the men that you know uh, the most homophobic in this case. But you wrote Roy as a kind of sympathetic figure who manages to understand his daughter and who became the parents that she always needed. Um, was it a deliberate choice to to kind of give give us a male figure that is sympathetic and also un understanding? Yeah. Um you know, like I said before, I was um, also playing around with gender, but you know, Roy, Roy did not want to raise true in the beginning. You know, when Patsy came to Roy, that um, saying to him, you know, you need to, um, you know, I'm asking you this one favor. You know, he resented that. But then, over the course of the novel, Roy grew into um, that father figure for True. In fact, he became the best person for True because he allowed True to be that tomboy, to be who True is, to be that soccer player. Uh, he, he ended up calling her champ. Right, like you're a champion, right? So Roy really nurtured that, and nobody in the community could mess with True. I mean, True was wearing her father's clothes; she had shaved her head, right? Nobody could mess with True because she's Sergeant Sergeant um, Beckford's daughter, right? So there's a level of protection there. So I um, wanted to actually bring forth the, the fact that, well, you know, yes, one parent may leave, but the, a community is also um, important in raising um, a child, an individual. Um, another thing to um with Roy is I, I, I don't want, um, want people to really commend him too much because I mean in, in our society when fathers are you know carrying their car the baby's carriages or they're you know, nursing them in, in a cafe or a public setting people are like oh my god he's such a good man you know they praise him right and um, I've always said to myself but he ought to be doing that that's his job as a parent right so I so that's why every time you know and um, like in conversations about Roy raising true and how well great he did um, over the course of the book I'm like well that was what he ought to have been doing in the first place right so um, so yes I really wanted to um, you know explore that side of parenthood but another thing I I, I, um, I didn't say in the beginning to in terms of my inspiration for Patsy I was also um, raised in a society well we many women right raised in a society where we have to we ought to aspire to, we were told that you know motherhood is the epitome of womanhood Right, you're not a woman yet if you're not a mother, right? But I've never felt um, maternal, and you know, one of the things that I always question as a Jamaican woman growing up in a society where you know, as soon as you're 22, you know, you're with child, right? Most of my friends had their first children in their in their early 20s, and it was something um, where I started questioning myself because you know, the, my clock, my, my biological clock was ticking, and I didn't have the courage to say I do not want to bear a child, right? So Patsy actually came to me during that time of my life when I was questioning motherhood, but because I like writing away from, um, from uh, actually like writing away from the social standards, right? I always like unpacking stories that nobody wants to talk about. So this woman who is an unwilling mother came to me because she kind of helped me to um, answer these questions for myself as well, right? What if, what, what if I don't want motherhood, right? But then bringing it further, Patsy never had a choice to begin with. Abortion is illegal in Jamaica, so it's not like she had that choice to have it to um, abort, right? So she's now having to raise this child and then daring to leave the child. So now begging the question, what do we gain or lose when we choose ourselves as women? Um, so really bringing that conversation around with, about motherhood and now through the lens of this working class Jamaican woman who is actually daring to make this, this choice, this decision decision um, by herself. Um, I'd like you to read short excerpts from the work and then we'll ask a few more questions. Uh, do you want to start? I think you should start. So I'm going to read from Yaz, who's a 19-year-old university student and her mother is Amma, who's a theatre director and a lesbian, and her father is Roland, who's a gay academic professor. Um, and her mother's got a show opening at the National Theatre in London called The Last Amazon of Dahomey, and um, Yaz is in the audience waiting for it to start. <clears throat> Yaz sits on the seat chosen by mum in the middle of the stalls, one of the best in the house, although she'd rather be hidden away at the back in case the play is another embarrassment. 
She's tied her amazingly wild, energetic, strong and voluminous Afro back because people sitting behind her in venues complain they can't see the stage. When her Afro compatriots accuse people of racism or microaggressions for this very reason, Yaz asks them how they'd feel if an unruly topiary hedge blocked their view of the stage at a concert. Two members of her uni squad, the Unfuckwithables, are seated either side of her. <laughs> Warris and Courtney, hard workers like her because they're all determined to get good degrees because without it they're stuffed. They're all stuffed anyway, they agree. When they leave uni, it's going to be with the huge debt and crazy competition for jobs, and the outrageous rental prices out there mean her generation will have to move back home forever. Yaz is reading English literature and plans to be a journalist with her own controversial column in a globally read newspaper because she has a lot to say and it's about time the whole world heard her. Mum's friends and diehards are dotted all over. They should be grey but are more likely to shave it off, dye it or cover it up with head wraps. She looks over at Sylvester, slumped in his seat, scruffy as hell in his tatty blue communist China overalls. His beard makes him more look, look more like an Amish farmer than an urban hipster. Way too old for it, Sylvie. His arms are crossed and he's scowling like he really wants to not enjoy the play before it's even begun. When he notices her ogling him, puts on a smiley face and waves, probably embarrassed that she's read her mind, his mind. She waves too, puts her nice to see you face back on. He's one of her godfathers, was, but, but was demoted to the sea list when he sent her the same birthday card three years in a row. A cheap, recycled charity one at that. As for birthday presents, he stopped them when she turned 16, as if she had no need for financial support once she could legally have sex. The A-list godparents part with money, lots of it, every year on her birthday. They're the best, as they really want to keep in with her as their conduit to the younger generation. A couple of godparents have disappeared altogether on account of falling out with mum over some pointless melodrama. Mum says Sylvester should stop sniping at other people's success, hers, and that as he won't change with the times, he's been left behind. You mean the way you felt not so long ago, mum? Ever since she landed the national gig, she's got very snooty about her struggling theatre mates, as if she alone has discovered the secret to being successful, as if she hasn't spent way too many of her years watching years of her life watching crap television while waiting for the phone to ring. This is the problem with having a daughter with X-ray vision. She can see through the parental bullshit. <laughs> Uncle Kerwin isn't with Sylvester tonight because he believes politics is way more dramatic than anything on stage at a theatre. Brexit and Trump quake. Behold the comedy of errors of our time being his latest mantra. As a Lambeth Labour councillor, he's usually at meetings firefighting or as Sylvester counteracts, causing them, because he likes to drag the carpet from underneath Kerwin's political self-importance. Who needs enemies, enemies when your life partner undermines you on a regular basis? Kerwin uses antiquated expressions like right on and likes to keep it real by frequenting the dingiest pub in Brixton where the old timers sit around still moaning about Maggie Thatcher and the miners' strike. One of the few pubs that haven't been turned into a wine bar, gastro pub or champagne bar as mum whinges. As if she herself wasn't part of the gentrification of Brixton years ago. As if she herself isn't a frequenter of the artsy hotspots like the Ritzy. As if she herself didn't take Yaz to one of the very champagne bars she supposedly scorns to celebrate passing her A-levels a year early. Just this once, Mum whispered as they entered the part of the indoor market that's now frequented by posh banker types who looked at them as they walked down the lane between bars as if they were looking at natives on their cultural safari. 
Yet who was it who was spotted at the Serial Lovers Cafe in Stockwell by one of Yaz's mates not so long ago? A cafe that specializes in selling over a hundred types of breakfast cereal at extortionate prices. A cafe that only those who've truly sold their soul to hipster style would even, hell would even think of venturing into. A cafe that so outraged the locals they keep smashing the windows in. As for dad, you can call me Roland. No, you're my dad, dad. <coughs> He's sitting a couple of rows in front of her. Excuse me. wearing one of his Oswald Boateng suits, brilliant blue on the outside, purple satin on the inside. Every so often, he casually glances around to see who's recognized him off the telly. Dad's budget and clothes could pay her university fees for a year, the very fees he says he can't afford. It's his thing, prioritizing fashion over the self-sacrifice of proper fatherhood. Hers is rummaging through his stuff in search of the large denomination banknotes he leaves in his jacket pockets, in his walk-in wardrobe, in the house on Clapham Common, with its white wooden flooring, yellow walls, and the original Cartier-Bresson photographs he chanced upon in a car boot sale in Wembley when he was a teenager and bought for a pound each. As he boasts to all first-time visitors when they walk past them in the entrance hallway, it's probably also fair to say she was probably too young at 13 to innocently open the drawer under his bed and come across a leather gas mask type thing with a leather dick attached where she presumed a nose should be along with associated whips, gels, handcuffs and other unexplainable objects. Unfortunately, once seen, never unseen. And it was a lesson for her at a young age that you never know people until you've been through their drawers. <laughs> and computer history. <laughs> One thing I loved about the book and got me through it is this moment of levity and, and fun that goes through, um, you know, the serious and the and the and the fun. Um, you please read a, a yes. little of yours as well. So to give this part context, so this is uh, in the middle of the book where Patsy's already in Brooklyn, New York, and you know, of course, stumbling upon the fact that she's undocumented, having to um, clean toilets. So this um, is really when she's suffering from one of her dark bouts. Um, Patsy suffers from depression, but it's not written in the book as depression, given that as working class Jamaicans, we don't have a word for depression. Um, but hopefully this scene is self-explanatory. There are two types of devil's cold. One in which you cannot bring yourself to leave the room, much less the bed, to do the simplest things. And the other in which you go through the motions in a constant stupor. Patsy lies in bed, turned away from the dark, heavy thing that has returned, its shadow dimming the room. With the cover over her head, she closes her eyes, not wanting to see it. God knows how long she has gone without eating. She could die, she knows, though death doesn't seem that scary after all. Not as scary as a dark thing. Here in America, there are no bush teas for it. No bitter mix of ram goat roses, rosemary, lemongrass, bissy, or other herbs. No pasta to come with a bottle of sanctified olive oil. No neighbor from the country who can wring the neck of a goat and sever it with a machete for you to bathe in its blood. No time to lie down and let it run its course. She's powerless against it. The real hell is allowing this place to eat you alive, Fiona says to Patsy, when she notices that she has been lying in the same spot on the bed inside their studio from sunup till sundown. How many rotations has the sun gone through since Patsy climbed in the bed that night after seeing Sicily? She slips in and out of sleep. She wakes to Fiona shaking her. Patsy, Patsy, Patsy. It reminds Patsy of her daughter's voice, how it would pull Patsy from the lips of her deep sleep. Here she's in the midst of it, hating it, terrified of it, and yet her only thought is of true. During those years, it was the anticipation of going to America to see Sicily that had kept Patsy alive. 
But what is keeping her alive now? Where will she find the strength that would protect her from the spells? How can she live knowing that she lost Sicily to her American dream? It's then that what Fiona had said about not having the luxury of choosing love makes sense to Patsy. That it's what, that's what it all comes down to, choice. When has she ever been given a choice? Never. She was never given the choice to say no the first time her legs were pried open. Never given a choice to rid her body of the grievance she had to carry for nine months. Never given a choice to look at another woman and allow herself to be carried by the feeling without blood. Bright red and glistening glass sticking to her like shadow. And now, now the promise of life comes with accepting the fact that she will never have a choice. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a little curious about uh, the decision, um, how to portray both True and Patsy, because the book starts as the story of Patsy itself, and the book is named after her. But at the end, we realize that we've been taken through the journey of two distinct human beings. Um, so I, I wonder whether you started it being a story of Patsy, and then you decided, well, let me give True some more time, or did you plan for each of them to both um, embody the story as two individual uh, characters. Yeah, the, the, well, the Patsy, the, I'm so, sorry, the story started out as Patsy's. Um, Patsy came to me as, as, as a confessional, right? Um, it was this woman who was basically just telling her story. And so I followed that narrative for a very long time. I followed it for like almost two years. It was just Patsy and what, you know, her expectations were of America and the disappointment that she ultimately faced, right? Coming to America, realizing that the love of her life, who was Sicily, had already moved on with a man. Right, um, so it was something that um, crushed her, and that really um, took up most of my time writing the novel. But then um, I went away, um, so I did this this residency where I was by myself for like four weeks, and in this residency expected to be writing Patsy's story again, just continue, um, continue in the process. But then True started speaking to me, um, and True's voice was more angry. And I'm like, um, you know, it came to me first in first person, right? This um, angry voice, like, oh, you know, um, this is what my mother did, right? That was the first sentence that came to me. And then in um, exploring that voice more, I realized that I can't tell a story about a woman who abandons her five-year-old daughter and not have the daughter's perspective as well. And that was really um, an epiphany, a moment of epiphany for me as I created the book because I realized that, well, it's more balanced when Patsy tells her story and then True also tells her story as well. Um, you know, any Caribbean person in this audience would tell you that, you know, it's so, it's so commonplace, you know, um, for our parents, one of our parents to leave and go abroad. And the expectation is that we ought to be grateful. We ought not to cry. And your grandparents or whoever is raising you would tell you, oh, you know, it's for the best. You know, don't miss them, don't cry, just know that it's for the best. The barrel is gonna come in at Christmas time and you'll be rejoicing then, right? And so even me and myself growing up as a barrel child, and that's really the child who, you know, waits on foreign things to come. My father migrated to the United States when I was three and was sending back money and gifts. And so I was told not to, not to cry. And so we never explored those narratives of the children left behind. So for me now, um, as this writer, I've decided to give True her voice. And True's story is so different from mine, though, is that in that True was abandoned, right? She didn't hear from Patsy, period. No gift, no letter, nothing for a good 10 years, right? She, the first time she would hear from her mother ever again was when she turned, what, 16, 17, um, which was a long time. But I knew I had to write her story and um, just to unpack what she goes through as that abandoned child. Yeah, and I think it makes it a lot more interesting. Um, starting the book and being empathetic to Patsy's ambition and what she was going through, and her own complaints about what her mother has done to her, you know, in the right. past, and all of that, and realizing over time that she actually had become that person as well right. for someone yes. else, and going through and realizing that, you know, we sometimes pass down the same traumas we're trying to exactly. escape from to someone right. else. Exactly. You know, I always joke um, that you know the patsies of our society, because I really I write from the lens of Jamaican working class women. Why? 
why? Because our stories are often so, we know, we, we, I said on a panel earlier, you know, we were socialized to respect our silences and shame more than our own voices. So we have so much untold stories. And so the generational trauma gets passed down when our grandmothers and our mothers refuse to communicate to us as the daughters coming of age, right? And so you kind of see that, that pattern, you know, Mama G abandoned Patsy, right? She might be physically present in the house, but she abandoned her by looking to the church, right? She was looking at these, um, at Jesus, but the cupboards were empty, right? Um, and another thing too, um, beneath that as well was mental health. Um, you know, in our culture, again, you know, we don't speak about mental illnesses, right? It's highly stigmatized. And so for Mama G, she wanted an, um, an escape, right? She was looking to the church for that escape. Patsy also suffers with depression like Mama G, and her escape was America and this woman, Sicily, right? And then she passed down to True, who, you know, she also suffers with depression as well. You know, she, um, and her outlet though is soccer. I mean, she, she cuts herself, given that, I mean, the, the, the cutting, I'll explain later on, given that we only have 20 minutes, but it, it's really this gender non-conforming person who can't deal with that in a society that's so um, polarized, right? And so for her, her out is soccer, but she has a private secret of cutting as well, so. Time goes by so fast. Yeah, I know, very minutes. quickly. Um, before I let people ask questions, and I will share some of my questions later, um, I'm curious about, again, the process. Um, to write a novel of this magnitude, um, I mean, I'm trying to see if you can take us into what your writing room looks like. Was there a chart on the board with connections as to how this connects to this, and how does that work? And then how do you sustain that, or do you, do you finish writing and then go, go back and add a few more connections? Uh, I mean, what's the process like, and how long did it take? So um, the novel was begun in 2013, so it took five years to write. Um, the process is kind of organic for me with most of my books in that I begin with an idea and then the story develops. So the structure of the book with the 12 different stories is not the order in which I wrote them. So I actually began with a character who's sort of in the sort of towards the middle of the novel um, and then other characters sprung off that. Um, I, you know, some writers write according to plots and they know exactly, or they think they know exactly what is going to happen in a book as they write it, whereas I'm not really able to do that. I think I, I'm too sort of, um, I, I'm, I'm too much of a believer in freedom and the imagination and what happens when I start to write characters is that they start to talk to me. So then I have an idea of them but then they emerge and their story emerges. So with this book you have all these different characters and they've, they're all on these different journeys and I did not know with each character when I started the journey where they were going to end up or where they were going to take me. So for example Carol, who I've mentioned, Nigerian parents, immigrant parents, you know, when I began writing her, it was her as a schoolgirl in a working class area of London wanting to do better in life. Something tragic happens to her and this propels her in another direction and she's also mentored by a teacher who helps get her, you know, who helps elevate her out of her class. And one of the things about Carol is that she is, um, once she goes to Oxford, she changes. You know, for anybody who knows Oxford and Cambridge, they're not like the sort of Ivy League, the, the Harvards and the Yales in the America, which are much more diverse. You know, Oxford and Cambridge in the UK are very white institutions and, and very middle class, and people have a certain way of talking. So as soon as she goes to Oxford, she starts to, she loses her kind of Peckham Street voice and starts to become very posh. And then by the time she leaves Oxford, she's integrated. At the beginning, she's not. At the beginning, she feels like an outsider and feels like she shouldn't be there. She has imposter syndrome and so on. But by the end, she has been completely assimilated into the Oxford culture and then goes into the banking culture. And she's very disparaging about her mother and her Nigerian culture. She looks down on it because she feels superior to it. Um, and, but, then she, but then that doesn't sustain itself eventually. So I did not know when I began writing the book that this was going to be what, something that happened to Carol. Um, I think as a writer, 
if you, you, you know, you have ideas and you dare to be bold. I'm a very bold writer. I like my characters to come alive and to leap off the page. I used to be, I used to work for the, in theatre, I used to write for theatre, and my characters have a very performative quality. And then, as I said, I've been writing a long time. So as soon as I start writing a character, all these possibilities emerge, and then I kind of work out which of the possibilities I'm going to follow in the act of writing them. So you were asking about process. So it's, it's the magic act of creation through which the characters, personalities, and characters emerge. Um, I'll talk about, say, another character. Um, let me think now. Uh, Sh Shirley. So Shirley is a school teacher. Um, and she's in her 50s. And she's somebody whose parents are Carib from the Caribbean, from Barbados. And she was born in Cornwall in the south of the country. Um, you know, she was born in a very white area um, in the very early 1960s because her father was from Barbados and wanted to, to be by the sea. I mean, it was a pretty disastrous move for his black family to be living in Cornwall all those years ago because the whole of the British countryside was just completely white then. It's not so white now, but it was completely white. But Shirley is born there, and then the family move her back to London and her and her, her brothers. And she ends up a teacher because, again, she's somebody who does quite well at school and she works hard. So she becomes a teacher. And maybe that should be the end of her story, but it's not because Shirley becomes a teacher and she's a very good teacher and she's working in a very multicultural school in London. But then the government, the Thatcher government, change the laws about the education system. And she finds herself really struggling with the new systems. And she has to work really hard. So she's somebody who begins as an inspired school teacher who loves her pupils and ends being somebody who absolutely hates them and resents teaching. But her mother, Winsome, from Barbados has worked on the buses for 40 years. So she, she's, she's, the, she's a character who represents the Windrush generation, generation in the UK, if you like. So she's worked on the buses for 40 years and has retired back to Barbados. Shirley is leading this very middle class life. She's been the school teacher all her life. Her kids have done well. She's married um, Lennox, who's a black man, who's a solicitor. And she, her mother doesn't understand why Shirley is unhappy with her life. Because according to her mother, Shirley has a great life. She has a professional career. She has her own house. She drives a big car. She has holidays. So, it, so one of the things the book does is look at mother-daughter relationships and how th different things are, especially for migrant, immigrant mothers and their children who are raised in the country, but also different in terms of their values and their expectations and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. That um, way of connecting both stories together, I think, is a good place to stop for now. I have a question for Bernadine, though, because um, one thing I wanted to ask you, were there any characters that you resisted? Because I remember, I remember resisting Patsy for so long because she was going to make that decision of abandoning her child. Were there any one of your characters? I mean, the, I mean this, this book, for def definitely for sure, and the other books that you had as well. Like, have you ever resisted a character based on the decision that you know they, they, they might make? Um, and kind of try to rein them in. Interesting. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Interesting question. Um, I wouldn't say resisted, but there are there's a character in this book who I started writing, and I, I was by the end of it, I was trying to get rid of her. <laughs> Because she wasn't working, she wasn't coming alive, and I just thought, I can't solve this problem. Sometimes characters don't, they don't do what you want them to do. Yes. And you've yes. put everything into them, as the same as all the other characters, but they're just not working. And I, in fact, this character is somebody who's no longer alive. So there's one character who's no longer alive. And she was born in the 19th century, and she's a black British woman. And I think what was happening was, there was t even though I've written characters set in the deep past, like a black Roman girl in, in, in The Emperor's Wave, I was kind of, the, hi the historical gap for me was so big that I somehow couldn't connect to her. And I was also, she had a difficult life and I was being too reverent okay. towards her. Because as you heard with Yaz, I'm very irreverent as a writer. That's where the humor comes from. So Yaz is irreverent to everybody. But as a writer, yeah. I'm irreverent to my characters. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's right. flawed. Everybody's yeah. hypocritical. That's who we are. That, you know, they're contradictory. That's who we are as human beings. And all those qualities I wasn't putting into this woman. And once I realized that and I yeah. put those qualities into her, 
she started to take shape. Yeah, yeah. Same with Patty and Margot as well. Here comes the sun, but yeah. Thank you very much. I know if we keep going, we're not going to leave here. And a few people, I assume, want to ask uh, questions. So if you have questions, raise up your hands. We're going to take a few. Um, I saw the first two hands in the middle there. Uh, if you could pass the mic, mic around, please make it very short so that they can answer. We take the questions, and then uh, we have 10 minutes to go, so we'll try to make it fast. Please just go straight to the question. Yes. Hello. So Tell us your name. Okay. Please yes. Please so my name is Franklin. Sorry. So my name is Franklin. Um, Nicole, I have just two questions for you. First of all, do you think that um, Cicely was trying to survive in her own way, based on the choices she made? Patsy, you mean, or Cicely? Cicely, yes, that's the love of Patsy's life yeah. that she went to America to see, and then it all ended in tears, as we see. So, do you think? Do you no think she spoilers, was, no spoilers. Yes. Okay, sorry. Do you think she was also just trying to survive? Then Thank the second you. question, just two. He said that, um, so Roy accepted True. Yes. So I, I struggle with that a bit, but do you think that was because, so True sort of the son he wanted to have, he wished he had. Exactly. So she was Max presenting, she played sport and all of that. Right. If she was just Max presenting without doing another, do you think she was, he, would, he would have accepted her and loved her the way he did? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. I just want to take questions on that. Uh, sorry, my question's for Bernadine, and I'm wondering, the Booker Committee said in their unprecedented decision to do two winners that they couldn't separate your novel from the testaments and i'm just wondering what's your reaction to that is that something you see the parallels of where they were coming from or is it hmm they pigeonhole multi-narratives check women check and just put you together I mean, what's your reaction to that any other question I yeah yes please sorry there's she's she raised the hand okay the person on the on the edge of the right Hi, my question is for Nicole. Um, I wanted to um, ask you how people um, are reacting to your um, treatment of this abandonment, because you're so right that people feel like it's not abandonment, they're doing it for you by going abroad and making money, but in essence, they've chosen money over the family. So I want to know more about how people are reacting to that. Right. The last one for this, for this first session. Hello, uh, my name is Comfort. Um, I wanted to ask a sort of practical question about putting together uh, a quick, novel quick, like quick, this. Quick, 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 quick. Our I'm, time is I'm trying. Out. Okay. Um, so you talked a lot about like writing and it sort of like flowing easily when you were actually writing, but then when it comes down to editing, how did you? What are some of the practical ways you sort of like try to keep, maintain the uh, like all of the perspectives without it becoming unwieldy? Okay, we'll take the responses, and if we have time, we'll go again. All right, so I'll answer his question first. So, um, Cicely, right? So, Cicely, yes, yeah, she was definitely trying to survive. So, for those of you who have not read Patsy yet, um, Cicely is Patsy's best friend. Pa um, Cicely is the one, they grew up together, they went to pri the same primary schools. So, they had known each other since they were eight years old, right? And there was a line um, when, we, when I first introduced Cicely that says, Cicely chose Patsy. What that meant is that Cicely is this light skinned Jamaican girl. She's mixed with white, so she has the um, long hair, and she has the blue eyes, and she has a pale skin. No, again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, like, I don't have to explain much here in Nigeria, um, like I do in the States or Europe, but we know that a, a girl like Cicely, given the, our post-colonial scars and colorism, is regarded as higher status, more beautiful, right? Now, Patsy, when Patsy met Cicely, she was alone. She was alone in the schoolyard. So Cicely basically you know, approached Patsy to be her friend. And Patsy, given that her self-worth was already questionable, latched on to Cicely, right? A girl like that is interested in you, then oh my god, right? Who am I? I don't, I'm undeserving. So Patsy had this, um, I mean, yes, it was a platonic relationship. It developed into a great friendship. But then there, was, um, it, there were blurred lines, right? Where, yes, um, there's, you know, Patsy really started having a 
attractions to Cicely. By the time Cicely left Jamaica, Patsy followed her, um, you know, in hopes of rekindling their romance, the romance that, that started in, when they were in high school, right, hoping that they would be together and live happily ever after, right? Cicely kind of embodied that browning, that high, the, um, the high yellow um, kind of, you know, given that she was told by our same society that she's the one who's going to make it, she became a trophy wife, right? So in the United States, she landed a husband. Um, you know, it was more to marry for papers, but then don't the relationship. Them. Don't tell them. I, know, I mean, this is not giving anything away. It's like in the first part of the book, where Cicely, okay, long, long story short, ends up with her American dream. So by the time Patsy comes, She's already married, and um, in, 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 in fact, yes, she's in a, an abusive relationship, but she's not willing to give that up. She's not willing to, change, to put down her crown as a trophy wife, right? She's already, she, has, she has already bought into all of that image. Um, so it was really, uh, I wanted to really tackle colorism in that capacity where, yes, there the, there's a blurred lines. Like, what is Patsy really attracted to? The, uh, wanting to be Sicily, right? The, the notion that she, if she's not a Sicily, then she's no, a nobody, or is is it really a romantic interest? And so that was a really um, interesting, like I had to really be careful when I was writing their, their relationship. And the next story was Roy. Um, so Roy has a son, Ken, um, True has a younger brother who's very effeminate, right? He's into the arts. And Roy is not a good father to, to um, Kenny, right? Roy definitely talks down to Kenny. He verbally abuses Kenny. He calls him a sissy. Meanwhile, yes, because True exudes that um, ability to play sports better than her brothers and you know she's a son that he never had so it's kind of interesting where when girls are um, oh, um, who step outside their gendered box you know especially in Roy's in that household it was uh, it was acceptable but the boy who does that he's the one who was demeaned um, so definitely that was intentional as well yeah. so I'll take this question so you're asking about after I would sort of drafted it Ha all the different considerations in order to edit it and sort of discipline the story, is that right? So, um, I always go through multiple drafts with my novels anyway. This went through four major drafts, but each, you know, each sentence almost, because especially as my background was in poetry, each sentence is very carefully crafted. So I'm constantly redrafting each sentence before I move on to the next, or sometimes maybe more than a sentence, two or three sentences and then a paragraph. So one of the things that editing involves for me is about crafting, crafting, crafting until the language is right, because this is very much a language novel in many ways. So that until the language is crisp, it's economic, it's concise, it's, way, it's weighted, and it's doing what I want it to do. So that's one of the considerations. But, they're, but they're, because there are 12 characters, um, and they are all, there, are the, there are all sorts of connections between them, a big issue was the chronology, creating the chronology so that it, it was synchronized throughout all the characters. So that was one of the things I had to do, which was really hard to do, that the characters that the, the, the characters were the right age and the right stage in their sections and in the sections of other characters, even though there may be many years that I'm ex exploring them, like or decades even. So that's something else I'm exploring. Then the characters have different backgrounds. So some of them are rooted in the Caribbean, some in um, Africa, different parts of Africa, and then some of them Black Britain or just Britain, some of them are the north of England. So I ha you know, even though it's written in the second person, when, when you, um, I've written it in such a way it's in the first person. So you're inside their heads with every character and you can hear their voices even though it's not first person. So then I had to make sure that their voices felt accurate. That and then, and then there's pigeon in there, there's patois in there, there's some a little bit of sort of northern kind of cadences in there, there's black London speech in there, there's standard English, there are various things. So I'm also going through looking at that. And then I'm looking at the emotional journey, the psychological journey, the physical journey of all the characters. And I'm looking at seeing how rich their stories are and how I am creating suspense with each story. That's something else that I go through. And so 
I can't even remember all the processes, but those are some of the things that I think about until in the end, I'm literally tinkering with punctuation and then it goes to my editor. Um, oh no, actually it goes to some of my readers who are very tough, they give me feedback. Then it goes to my editor who I've been with for 20 years and he has his readers, they give me feedback and then it goes through another draft until in the end, it's absolutely as it needs to be. The question about the Booker Prize, um, I'm just happy to get the Booker Prize. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to share it with Margaret Atwood, she's amazing. You know, it's good, it's all good. <laughs> And then um, Nana's question about um, Patsy, the, the reviews are, um, what, what, the, what the, um. The reaction to your discussion about the men versus being grateful for Yeah. Read yeah. reactions? Um, yeah, I, so, so first of all, I have gotten a lot of um, feedback from women. Um, you know, that's the thing, because in society, like I said before, we were socialized to aspire to motherhood, right? But who are, the people who are, have been reaching out to me after Patsy got published were actually women who had children, or women who um, you know, were told that they ought to be considering children, thanking me for that narrative of the, the woman who actually does not, or you know, felt like she you know, could actually walk away from this. Because it wasn't easy to write Patsy, um, which is why I asked Bernadine that question, like, you know, how do you ever um, rein in a character when they're trying to lead you in a, in a very dark, um, path. And so for Patsy, when I, uh, to sit at my desk and write a Patsy abandoning her child, it was hard at first, but then I had to ask myself that question, you know, but what about those stories, those women who are walking around and we never hear their thoughts about motherhood, right? They, they never utter it all out in conversations because it's socially unacceptable, right? We're viewed as pariahs if we dare say out loud that we don't want to be mothers. And so that, um, it's, it's really great now to be hearing from those women, you know, thanking me for that narrative. And also the truths of forces Society, the children who were abandoned, um, saying that it actually helped them to understand their mothers, right? And the reason why she had to be abandoned. In fact, uh, one um, poet said to me, um, another a Jamaican poet who got, who, her mother abandoned her at the age of two years old. And she said to me last week that, um, you know, she was so, she was always so angry at her mother, but now that she is a woman herself, um, she kind of think, you know, she kind of forgave her mother saying that that woman actually chose freedom. Because you do have the women who stay, and when they stay, they resent their children so much that they end up actually abusing their children or you know it, it would have been better off the, if the child was raised with somebody else because a child can sense the mother's resentment you know I see them in, I live in New York City and I see these black women and women all over from different cultures and races look at their two-year-old and literally abuse them in front of uh, many people you know and you're like, where is that coming from obviously it's coming from somewhere deeper and so now you know wanting to write a story of that woman who dared to say I'm not the best person to raise my child, even though I gave birth to her, I want to leave because she may be better off with somebody, raised by somebody else. Yeah. Thank you. Please let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> They've written uh, phenomenal books. I've enjoyed reading, reading them and I've enjoyed having this conversation with you. So thank you and thank you everybody. Uh, just to say, it doesn't happen often, but it's already happened. Bernadine's book is already sold out.